think to start recording. So um, broadly speaking, we're in the latter stages of a uh, module of this course on ABMs, on Asian-based modeling, which is focused on the role that uncertainty plays uh, in these, these dynamic models. And uh, we took a look at, at how stochastics influence uh, ABM outputs for most ABM because of their sort of low level of characterization of a situation, characterization of individual events and the actions of individual parties. While aggregate models deal with broad patterns and often overlook stochastics, uh, HMIS models really zero into them. Um, and we brought that understanding with us when we uh, came to look at sensitivity analysis and systematically varying parameters to see how they impacted model results. And we learned uh, there that to reflect on the fact that agent-based models are not merely often stochastic, they're typically nonlinear. And that can lead to marked sensitivity of those models um, to some parameters when compared to others. And moreover, depending on where a model is in its evolution, its location and state space, to use a concept I'll be introducing later in more detail, um, because uh, you know, depending on where it is, you can get also strikingly different levels of sensitivity to parameters. So maybe at one early on in the state space when there's lots of susceptibles, it's very, very sensitive to you know, details of the contact rate and the transmission probability. Small differences there are related to grow at very, very different rates. But maybe once herd immunity has been reached, and you have very, very few susceptibles around. It's predominantly recovered with a smattering of, of susceptibles and effectives. There, are, the model's results day to day or month to month may be quite insensitive to the particular values of the contact rate and transmission probability around, around their, their current values because they're consistently too low to allow the virus to survive in the population or the pathogen to survive. So we can have quite different sensitivities based on model state. And uh, that bears keeping in mind, we're gonna be discussing this notion of state space and aspects of model state shortly, but uh, it bears noting that sensitivity is contingent. It's contingent on the current state of of, of that model. And last time we talked about calibration and today we're gonna to finish that up. Um, and we're going to be discussing, uh, going on to discuss uh, some factors that in some sense I wish we had, I had, had the presence of mind to introduce earlier, um, uh, a planned lecture on model output, including aspects of model visualization model um, output of data, routine data and so on. I'm, I'm going to try to schedule in shortly. And we have some discussion I wanna have about comparing model outputs in light of stochastics. Uh, but today I wanna finish up the discussion of calibration, if I could. Um, we had covered a lot of the essentials last time and I'm gonna go over the key points from that and uh, highlight a few features. And then we're going to go on to discuss uh, some, uh, some, some additional learnings uh, with respect to it. So uh, I did want to post my slides from today so people can follow along with them. And uh, at the cost of of taking a moment to do that, I think I will do so because 
uh, students may benefit from being able to see some of these slides, even after I've, I've flipped off them. So uh, if you give me just a moment, I'm going to get my slides up on the course site. These are an updated version of the calibration slides I posted earlier. Um, they're, they may uh, carry a similar name, but they, uh, they are in fact uh, an updated set of them, which uh, with some additions I think could be really useful. So I'm just posting these here and we will get going. Okay, so I would like to name that so it's a little bit clearer that it's a different version. So pardon me. Ladies and gentlemen, versions, maintaining different versions of computational artifacts explicitly, making it clear with what version you're dealing with is uh, part of the art of taming complexity in the computational sphere and heading off problems. Um, and uh, I would encourage everyone, so the slides are posted, I would encourage everyone uh, to uh, make use of uh, good versioning techniques early and often when you are uh, uh, when you're building models. So uh, I had early on in this class uh, exhorted you to build models up bit by bit by bit, adding things, running them, and learning from them before adding the next, adding, learning, running, um, adding, running, learning, I should say, um, in this sort of cycle. And there were many reasons for that. Spotting issues, spotting errors, uh, uh, the chance to learn the learning from the model now can help you decide what to add next. In fact, you could show it to stakeholders and they may realize they have different priorities than they, they, they learn. You can, you can, your learning often gives you a clue as to where certain behaviors are coming from. And sometimes they're not acceptable um, to your goals. They, they fly in the face of, of um, what you think is needed for the model, in which case you can update those and refine those formulations. So build and run and learn early and often. Um, and part of the art of doing that is to maintain successive versions of the model and make sure you have recourse to earlier ones. If you're comfortable with Git, using Git repositories with GitHub or, or other Git uh, repositories, um, you should you should use that where possible. If you don't feel comfortable with that uh, or with other version control systems like Subversion or or older ones, uh, then what you can make use of is is you know your own naming system to name them successively with different names, uh, version one, version two, et cetera. But uh, this can allow you to keep track of what's in what version of, of the model uh, along the way and what outputs came from what version of the model. And then it allows you to go back and reproduce the results that you created earlier for that paper you submitted or for the report or for, you know, in a presentation. Um, it's part of the traceability we we seek to maintain in scientific research and uh, with modeling uh, in particular. So uh, make sure you use versions. And I, I created a version of those slides and you could see it posted now, it's the calibration one. Okay, so let's uh, remember where we're at with this, right? Um, so uh, calibration was part of a, set of techniques for broadly inferring things about a model. Uh, here we're focused on inferring the values of parameters, estimating the values of parameters. In other cases, um, other of these methods will estimate not just the parameters, but the latent state of the models, the what's going on at a given time in the model. Uh, 
moving beyond thinking just about parameters to given that the model is stochastic um, and that lots of things are possible for a given set of parameters, what's the case right now? Uh, I'll come back to one of them, particle filtering at the end of today's lecture as time allows, uh, just to sort of situate it. But um, for now, we're, our focus is on calibration. Um, and I noticed that in some sense, calibration is taking this kind of this dark matter of data, this all this evidence from the world, all this, all these um, types of information we have from the world that can't be boiled down to any one parameter. Uh, it because it's the result of lots of parameters. So if we see incident cases in the world, um, surely they're affected by contact rate and transmission probability. They're but they're affected also by other factors such as the incubation time of the infection and how many people get found by contact tracing or get found by drive-through testing or get or walk in to be to present for care themselves and get found. It's a result of a lot of different things. Same thing with hospitalizations. Uh, it, it depends on some hospitalization rate, but it depends also the number of people coming in any, every day is it's also a factor of those other things I mentioned. Uh, same thing with deaths, et cetera. So, you know, typically we have a lot more data from the world um, that is of this emergent type that it results from this complex interaction of factors. Then we do data about very specific parameters. We may have data in some cases about specific parameters from meta-analyses, from, from randomized clinical trials in, in some cases, from very careful experiments uh, carried out in, in lab settings, or experiments carried out with um, enormous care, looking uh, look at the population observationally, but, but keeping track of information uh, very carefully say about who lives in the same home as whom, and you're looking at transmission rates from uh, from an infective with COVID-19 to other people who have not been vaccinated living at the same home in the same home and are therefore not masking, et cetera. And, uh, and so there's some data, some small set of data that can be used directly to estimate parameter values, but often we have a much larger set of data from the world that's emergent patterns from the world. And uh, in modeling, in dynamic modeling, because dynamic models give rise to comparable empirical, uh, comparable emergent data, we can compare that to what we see from the world and try to find assumptions about areas of the model we're less certain about that will allow the model to best match what we see from the world in these emergent patterns. So would allows us to try to arrive at these specifics for dynamic hypotheses that explain these things in the world. And in the process, it challenges our understanding of the world and can help falsify it or, or tell us that it just doesn't add up to be consistent with the world. Um, and that's perhaps the premier use of models to learn. Again, models are not truth, but models can speed us towards the truth by helping to more quick to more quickly spot sort of inconsistencies in our thinking, spot places where our thinking is off base. Um, we think it's so, we think it's this way, but it just ain't so. Um, uh, so, we talked last time about calibration uses and optimization algorithm to try to adjust its assumptions about unknown parameters so that the model results, the resulting model um, best matches this observed data from the world. So it's trying to find different values of, of typically several parameters at once, potentially 
you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten, in extreme cases, parameters at once. Adjusting these values of the parameter with larger values of beta, smaller values, larger values of mu, smaller values, larger values of tau, smaller. Trying to explore in this space to find the particular assumption about parameter values that allows the model to best match uh, the data. And in order to, to undertake that process, there's a set of things we have to specify. We have to specify which parameters we're varying here, mu, beta, tau, but, but in general, there may be you know, contact rate and mean recovery time after infection, you know, time to clear the infection and, you know, probability of mortality given, given severe infection and probability of having an asymptomatic versus a mild versus a severe infection, various parameters. And we have to designate which of those we're trying to estimate, which of those we're trying to vary to find the best match of the model to the observed data. We have to specify something about what algorithm we're going to use to match. But we also want to specify what types of information from the world are we matching? And how do we judge a goodness or badness of fit? And I mentioned that there's commonly an assumption of that you'll have some way of specifying that goodness or badness of fit using something called a, an error function or a discrepancy function or an energy function. And uh, I'm using terms, discrepancy function, uh, error function, to probably communicate that larger values mean the model's worse in terms of its ability to predict the world. There's a bigger gap, a bigger discrepancy between the model's outcomes on the one hand and what we see from the world. And uh, in varying it, we try to get it uh, to be a better and better fit, right? Um, so we're trying to assess this goodness of fit and vary the parameters to get as good fit of possibility as, as needed or as, as possible. Now, I talked last time, I mean, reference the fact that when we design this measure of how well a model fits the world, we, we want to design it in a judicious way. We want to design it in a thoughtful way, in a way that, that not only does a worse fit generally mean the model is further from the world, but so, so that it's designed so we can robustly take advantage of certain features. And one of the most important is that it's dimensionless. And, and one of the things this means is uh, that this reflects is we want to be able to match in a given, given uh, matching between model output and real world data, multiple types of data. So that example we saw last time, um, which maybe I'll seek to pull up now uh, if, if I can. And it looks like uh, I will seek to see, okay, so uh, I will need to, okay, I think I'll leave that for now. But um, that example in any logic where it was trying to match model outputs against that empirical curve, that is just one type of data. But in general, we're often going to have multiple sorts of data. Maybe we'll be matching model output against a set of data from the world involving new cases, maybe uh, new hospitalizations, maybe deaths, uh, maybe uh, recoveries. Um, and we want the model to, to match its output against data from the world for all of these. But some of them will be much larger than others, right? Like cases, cases, we may be dealing with thousands of cases in bad days, but for hospitalizations, we might be dealing with hundreds, right? Um, 
uh, and deaths, we might be dealing with, you know, uh, in a really bad day, 10 or, or 20. Um, and we don't want it to put all the eggs in the basket of cases just because the numbers are big, you know, that it says, well, I can match cases really closely and I'll just be off by 50 in terms of deaths. No, 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 that doesn't cut it, right? Because you, you want to you want to recognize that even though deaths are numerically smaller than cases, being off by 10% in either of them, maybe you want it to treat that as equally bad, for example. Um, and the way to, to catch this is, is to make it dimensionless. So for example, match up the proportional discrepancy between them. So for example, being 10% off, 10% more, it's the same regardless of whether you're matching 10 deaths to from the world for 11 deaths from the model or whether it's a thousand cases from the world and 1100 from the model you know uh, and so we we often want a metric that allows we we generally want a metric that will allow us to use multiple sorts of data and a key need here is to be able to add up in a single discrepancy function, these multiple sorts of data. Um, so these multiple, these multiple types of discrepancy. So, um, you know, one way to do that is to make use of a dimensionless quantity. So it's a fraction here. So what's in the numerator, the same type of what's in the denominator. So if it's cases in the numerator, it's cases in the denominator. And so it's a, you know, a 10 cases in the denominator versus 11, let's say, in the numerator. And so it's 1.1. 1 .1. And there could be a thousand, uh, oh, sorry, a thousand cases in the denominator and 1100 in the numerator, or it could be 11 deaths in the numerator and 10 in the denominator, and you still get 1.1. 1 .1. Um, so, Often we have these, these dimensionless quantities, which we, we use, and then we multiply them by weight. And this weight allows us to say, we care more about matching X than Y. Maybe your model's concerned with mortality. And maybe really in the end of the day, you're dealing with an infection where, you know, cases come and go and, you know, a lot of people are testing at home with antigen testing and you miss them and you know that, but, you know, deaths are, are, are more, um, you know, you're not going to have people elect not to come to the hospital if they're in very bad shape. So you're more sure of that. If, if you wanted to concentrate on the mortality side, the very serious side, you would make the weight for mortality quite high. And you would have a, a sum of these terms. For example, weight times this quantity, I'll get to the square in a minute for say cases, and then another such term added to it, one for deaths, and another such term added to it for hospitalizations with different weights. So there'd be a weight for hospitalization, a weight for death, and a weight for cases. And if you were really focused on severe cases, um, the weights for hospitalization and death would be much larger than for cases, for example. That's a, a common. Um, so we often use weighting to sort of reflect what we care about more in our metric. What, at the end of the day, what is it we want to, we want it to really care the most about in its match? If you don't have a preference, fine. Give them all equal weights but recognize that often models have purposes. And while you may be making use of a lot of types of data, there may be certain of that data that relates to model behavior that's more central to your interest, to your purpose of the model. So you may want to weight that. Um, it's nice for reasons I won't get into in terms of the mathematics, if this is what's called an analytic function. And basically it can be differentiated is what we care about. And what that allows um, uh, an intelligent optimization tool to do is to, is to uh, plan the optimization more cleverly. 
so that um, it can try to get better, get to lower and lower values in a more principled way. Uh, and it may speed it up. Uh, I said I'd get back to that. Oops, sorry. Said I, I'd get back to this uh, this exponent here, this two. Why is that there? Why is this squared? Why isn't it just so the, you know, we leave it out? Well, um, there's some good reasons here. First of all, um, you certainly don't want this to be negative, right? Like um, here, I'm showing a point match. So here, you know, get back to this point, no point intent, no pun intended later, okay? But um, I'm showing the point match between historic data, that's H, and model data, that's M. And so one dimensionless way you could do it is you could say, look, I have historic data, maybe it's a thousand. I have a model generated data, I'm trying to compare for it for the same point in time, maybe it's 1100, uh, 1100. Um, so here, the model is bigger than the historic data, right? So it's 1,000 minus 1,100. That's, that's negative. That's minus 100, you know, over the average of the two, uh, uh, over 1050. But you don't want this to be negative. <laughs> that, that's not good. That would be, that would imply, like, it could cancel out, like, like oh, it, it'll cancel out being off in terms of deaths or something, which wouldn't make sense. Uh, yeah, they can equal together, fine, in which case it's, it's an error of zero, zero for this. It matches exactly. Um, but one reason we want this square is because if this is negative, bad things happen. We we don't want that. You know, uh, professors like me cry if it's if it's negative. So we don't we don't want we don't want me to cry, I hope. Um, and so one you can square it, but there's another reason we square it. it and it turns out that by making it concave up, by, by squaring it, um, what it leads to, uh, I'm not going to go through the math of it, but what it leads to is it preferring more small errors across multiple of these things added together rather than one larger, than a larger in one Instead of the scapegoat, you say, uh, you know, we don't care about cases and the others will be perfect. You want it to kind of um, try to try to form something that's pretty good on all of them across the board. And it turns out the square um, will end up helping that. And if you think about it, it's, you know, two small discrepancies of A, of size A, maybe it's of uh, 10%. Could be considered more desirable than having one of twice that and the other is zero, say one of 20% and the other is zero. And if you think about it, if you square 2a, you get 4a squared, man. And that's a lot worse than a squared plus a squared if you have two discrepancies of size a. So, so that's where the square kind of comes from here. It's, it's, uh, it's preferring. Small ones distributed across to one big one that's on the scapegoat and the thing we say, ah, oh, forget about that one. We'll we'll do well in the others and forget about it. No, no. You want it to be balanced and, and you want it to be not negative. Uh, the, the square helps with that. And it should be symmetric too. So if you're off by a factor of two, um, it'd be kind of nice if it were. The same if you are 50% less and 50% more, it'd be kind of nice if it impacted in the same thing. And, and you'd like it to be finite, so it shouldn't be infinite. So this is one strategy for kind of matching. And this was designed, the slide was designed with this idea in mind is matching at a given time point, say, what the model produces versus what the what the, the historic value is, the empirical value. But the truth is this, this general mechanism works for a lot more than point matching and time. And for ABMs, for ABMs, um, 
often we don't want to match point-wise in time. And, and you may recall this. Um, so, you know, when it's a messy world out there. And if we're looking at historic time series, even those that exhibit marked regularity, like these graphs of, of, of pertussis notifications in England and then Wales, um, you know, in the pre-vaccination era, there's a lot of regularity there. There's a lot of orderliness. There's a lot of structure there, isn't there? You know, these sort of periodic out, out and you can kind of you can kind of see it here too in terms of these these sort of bursts, these it kind of has a beat to it. But it's not totally deterministic. It's not totally periodic. It's not like a sine wave where exact timing is, is all set. Instead, it it has structure, but there's stochastics in it. Um, you know, this year here, around 19, the early 1950s, um, uh, you know, there's this peak and, and it almost looked like it would take off and then it died out, right? Same thing here, same thing here. But but these years, you didn't see much of that precursor. Uh, here you had this kind of double peak, um, you know, closer. So it's it's not... It's not deterministic. Here's for chickenpox in Saskatchewan. And you see something similar, maybe half a world apart, but it you, you again see this mixture of a lot of structure and with with some uh you know so, uh, quite a bit of variability here with measles and mumps, you know. Um and uh, some years they're high together on um, your peaks at the same year, this is monthly. Some years they're they're very uh, very different, and it's not periodic. Um, so for ABM, um, we generally are really challenged because of stochastics engaging in point matching of historic data. When I say point matching, I mean matching for different times exactly what value is observed. For example, trying to match up, you know, on, on January 1938, we had this many cases. In February 1938, we have this many. In March 1938, we have this many. If you go in and you try to point match for each, say, of a set of, of data in a time series, or if you did it for measles and mumps, you're bound to be disappointed at some point because. The world is variable. The world has stochastics. The model has stochastics. And a given run of the model may not match uh, all that well against the world. And of course, if you run the model in an ensemble, we talked about this for the for the for the stochastics on. Um, if you run an ensemble, a collection of runs, a collection of these realizations, they'll exhibit a variety of outcomes, right? Um, and the world's maybe the world's representation may be somewhere in there. What happened? Um, but if we want to assess for a given set of parameter values how good a match it is against the world we probably want to find a better way of doing that than trying to judge for each month exactly how good was it. Because the model parameter values may be very, very appropriate, but for most runs of, with those parameter values, it will be off in some notable ways. And it's just for a small subset of runs will happen to have the same, uh, the same twists and turns of the curve, the same crenulations, um, the same nooks and crannies of it, right? Um, it's only for a small set of these stochastics. So we'd like we'd like a measure of goodness, a fit that's more robust than trying to match point wise. We could run it a hundred times and we won't get anything quite like this but we may be very close in some important measure, right? Maybe we get the frequency right. Maybe we get this rhythm right, right? Maybe we're, we'll try to match this and 
what we really get is this rhythm and the fact that sometimes we have these false peaks before it. And, and we have, if we have a big jump one year, we don't see many cases for the next bunch of years, right? Which is, again, a regularity here, right? Um, maybe we've got all those essentials right. And we don't want to just doom it because we say, well, we don't match precisely what number it is on what day. That would be a fool's errand, right? Um, that would be setting ourselves up for an unrealistic level of, of somehow prognostication. Um, and it would be false precision in a certain way. What we want is, is a good measure that's robust, right? That captures the essential features of the situation, captures the uh, essential orderliness to it without without you know uh, crucifying us on this cross of of sort of exact matches um uh to quote William Jennings Bryan or to paraphrase him so um uh, or to adapt him I should say so um you know ABM calibration because of system stochastic rarely allows for these closed point matches and and you can't condemn a given set of assumptions about parameter values because it doesn't exactly match in one realization and 10 realizations and 100, because it's very unlikely you'll exactly match it up. But you want to capture the broad features of it. And so we, we use sort of summary measures. We try to get the essential features. And I point to this work by one of our class members, Wade McDonald uh, here, um, you know, uh, together with Karsten, uh, Karsten Hempel and Alex Doroshenko, um, uh, looking at pertussis, you know, to give some examples of here of, of what we could do. So we could look at things like mean incidence across the population. This abstracts away from exactly what month it occurs in or what week or what day. It's saying, you know, um, on average per year, what's kind of the mean incidence we encounter? Or, you know, if we look at the distribution of incidences on a yearly basis, how many cases do we see if we, if we construct a cumulative distribution? So what this is saying is, you know, uh, there's very few years where you have fewer than this a log scale, this, this one here. So there's very few years where you have fewer than five cases here. So I guess five would be about here. Um, there's quite a few where you have 10 or fewer, um, virtually all where you have 100 or fewer, and you know 50 or fewer, the vast majority are 50 or fewer here, right? This is a cumulative distribution. So it's, it gives the probability of having less than or equal to this, this number shown by the y-axis. This is the probability of having less than or equal to, to that number. Okay, this is autocorrelation. So this gets at this, this issue of, if you have, a, for example, a high value one, one month, how, what is, uh, what's the value the next month? Um, you know, uh, or how correlated is the, the value this month and the value the next month, right? Um, uh, how correlated are the value this month and two months out, two months forward, or this value right now with time t and the value of time t plus three, right? Um, so uh, if you start to see something like this, you might say, wow, there's, you know, uh, there's going to be something where you see a negative autocorrelation because if it's really, really high now, you know, maybe five months from now, it's likely to be very low. So I'd expect an autocorrelation between, you know, if I compare the value at time T with the value of time, say T plus six months, so half a year later, I expect it will be negative because if it's very low now, if it's very high now, it will be very low then. If it's very low, then the chances are not bad. Could could well be six months from now it will be higher, right? Um, so you can look at this autocorrelation. That's 
I want to say auto here because we're comparing this, the value of this, with the value of this uh, itself, uh, but lag uh, next month or the next month or the next month. So autocorrelation is a good me um, measure. They also looked at, if you look at individual uh, um, susceptibility to infection, and you were to assess, assess the relative risk of getting infected based on some time since the last dose of the vaccine, how quickly does, does, um, uh, does that uh, drop off here? Um, so uh, I, I probably got that, that wrong here, but because um, uh, it looks like it, it goes up uh, 1.3. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll uh, have to figure that out later. So this is another measure coming out of the model, which is a summary of the contact network induced by the model. Here, the contact network is an emergent feature. The model has lots of little contacts at work, at, or sorry, at school, at home, for example, in the community. And there's, from all of those, these interactions at school, these interactions in the community, there's an induced contact matrix by age across different people. And this, this shows a sort of structure which matches up very nicely against historic attempts to deduce contact networks, okay? Okay, so um, what, what might you match? Okay, so given that you wanna be cautious about matching on a point-wise basis, which is very common for calibration in aggregate models, you map point-wise. Um, uh, what might you wanna map here? Well, um, the types of things, the types of data you map, the type of information um, that you're collecting to inform your map are gonna be Commonly fairly familiar, but it might be like cumulative counts, like cumulative incidents, right? I mean, really, that's what was used here. Cumulative incidents within a year, for example. And this is a cumulative distribution showing for the yearly incidents, the cumulative number of cases across the year, sort of how the cumulative distribution changed. But this mean incidence is based on the sort of cumulative amount um, over the entire time period. Uh, you might have a cumulative incidence rate, an attack rate, the fraction of the population that was infected by the end of the model uh, versus what seems to be shown from seroprevalence data from the world. Um, there might be aspects of individual level state that you're collecting information on. You know, uh, the, the number of times people have sought care in an SDI clinic or something like that. That might be an aspect of their, their state, right? Um, or the fraction of them that are asymptomatically infected versus symptomatically infected. It's an aspect of their state. Um, and there might be, yeah, some individual history. Um, you know, the kind of times they've gotten vaccinated or the kind of times they've presented for care, the kind of times they've been hospitalized, the kind of times they've shown up in the emergency room, whatever. Or the time between certain things. So the amount of time it's been since I last was vaccinated or something along those lines. Um, that might be data you get from the world and you might be able to get data from the model with that. But this is a sort of type of information I might be dealing with. And then there are these summary descriptions of this that you want to match between the models and the world. And you know, you might be interested in what is the mean incidence or what looked across a monthly basis, what's the median monthly incidence from the world and from the model. What's the mode? What's the single most likely value for the number of times someone has come to the SDI clinic over the, the uh, five-year period or what have you? Um, 
There might be temporal summary. So, so maybe you, you do a fast Fourier transform on something like this, and you get the dominant mode. You get the frequency, the single most likely frequency band. So maybe it's one per seven years or something like that. If I took this and I were to stick it into MATLAB or I were to stick it into R or Mathematica, or what have you, Sage, and I were to do an FFT on it, um, I, I would see a dominant component. Uh, the FFT gives me a fast Fourier transform. It gives me the frequency distribution. How much of each frequency is there in this? So there might be a little bit of monthly frequency. Um, uh, there might be, you know, a yearly frequency would probably be pretty significant because of the effects of, you know, uh, schools coming into session and going out of session and summer vacation and winter holidays and stuff like that. There's probably a, a, a yearly mode that's fairly strong. But then, as we could see here, there's some sort of multimodal thing going on, right? If 1955 was a high year, and then 1957 maybe again, and then 1959, and then 1961, and then 63, it looks like a two-year cycle. So probably, you know, a, a frequency of every, every two years once every two years would be quite hot. So, you know, you can you could try to get the model, the analysis, the model data, which is stochastic, to see if you can reproduce that. Um, Autocorrelation, we, we explained that earlier with, with uh, what was done in, in Wade and Carson's paper. Um, and you could look at, you know, for sample points in time monthly, for example, Histograms of you know how many people have come in once in the past month or twice or or three times or four times or five times. Another thing you might do is is summarize the histogram over population members. So some population members are um, at any one time. Well, um, okay, so this would be sample points in time um, for the population, you could do it over population numbers. So some people come in one time, two times, three times, et cetera. So these are summaries, right? They're, they're summaries of what's going on. You could summarize it over time, autocorrelation or frequency mode is an example of that histogram based on how many monthly cases there have been or a cumulative distribution like we saw right here. Um, right right here um but you could also have um uh you could also have uh, a histogram summarizing right now on a monthly basis how many people have come into the sdi clinic in the past month um you know different numbers of times or come into the emergency room or what have you um or you could do a histogram summarizing how, how many vaccines, vaccine doses that people in the population had? There'll be some group that have had zero, some with one, some with two, some with three, et cetera. And you could summarize, you know, over the entire time of the model, across all population members, how many had, you know, for the first two years of the model, how many had this many vaccinations, right? Yeah, rate of immigration between cities would be, yeah, how many, um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, how many cities have they lived in in the past five years or something like that. Um, so um, with nature-based models, though, it bears noting that we have a lot more than temporal dynamics we're dealing with. Remember, when we have emergent behavior from, from, models that are aggregate in character. We're typically thinking about emergence over time. Here we are thinking about emergence that may be occurring along networks or along space, over space. There are these patterns that occur across networks where maybe 
you know, in crowded area of the networks with high density, that's where the infection tends to stick. In low density, it tends to, to not stick there. Um, uh, in other models, you're actually looking at network structure itself being emergent, who's connected with whom. And so there you might use measures associated with the density of the network. What of all the pairs of connections that could be there, what fraction of them there are? That's the density of the network. Or what's called the degree centrality. You could look at the mean or the median or the mode or the histogram for it across the population. That'd be the, you know, if you look at people, to how many others they're connected or between this centrality, sort of how many hops are there to get to another, another person. There's something called eigenvalue centrality, which is another measure of centrality. Um, spatial location, you could also look at spatial measures about where people live in the model compared to similar data from the world or for mobility measures like dwell time or radius of gyration or entropy rate. These are different measures by which you could summarize people's mobility. So this is a whole lot of different metrics, but the basic gist is to get away from the madness of trying to point predict for each time exactly how many cases you'll be. Because a model could be a great model, super useful, even if it's unable to exactly match, you know, on a point by point basis, each of these data points, right? It could be a just fantastic model. It can't be expected, it can't be judged, can't be condemned for an, un, for an inability to predict the exact month where it's gonna peak. But maybe if it does peak, it knows there's a very good chance two years from now it'll be peaking again. And that's what you want. You don't want it to necessarily be judged against, you know, uh, whether or not it can know on this day, it can prognosticate, we'll have a high number. It's rather that it captures the regularities that it knows the rhythm of it. It knows the, uh, the sort of general cycles that it's capturing. So um, in this particular paper, for example, they used a, uh, uh, a log likelihood uh, type um, motivation, although this was not strictly a, a Bayesian model, but uh, it was looking at um, uh, using uh, probably density functions to assess the kind of discrepancy between things. Um, this would be for the cumulative distribution function. This is the autocorrelation function. This is age specific incidence. And they had a weighted sum of these. This would be another sort of dimensionless type way of, of, of capturing this. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, those of you who are familiar with regression methods may be struck by a certain similarity here. In regression, we are seeking to get a model. In this case, it's a, it's a regression type model. It may be a generalized linear method, for example. Maybe we're using logistic regression, for example, or linear regression. And we have a certain form for that. And we want to match the empirical data, some dependent variable. And we have a set of independent variables, covariates, explanatory variables, each of which is associated with a parameter, beta zero for the intercept, beta one for the first parameter, beta two for the second parameter, et cetera. And in regression, we're trying to estimate the parameters that will let the model best match the data for the dependent variable, right? And we have measures of goodness of fit for them. And indeed, there's, there's a certain kinship here, but it's only a distant kinship. And it's more superficial than, it, than, than deep. Um, there's a big difference here, a foundational difference, which is regression models, the functional form 
of the, the model output on parameter values is given explicitly. You have something like, you know, uh, y equals beta zero plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x two. And you're trying to arrive at an estimate of the betas, the parameters. But the form of it that is matching the observed data is, is given. This is beta zero plus beta one times x one plus beta two times x. And, and you're matching the observed data about the world, observed data y against them, right? Um, with a simulation model, you, you don't have a form for the model behavior over time or over networks or over space. It's emergent. It comes from the model. It is generated by the model. And this is true regardless of whether it's an aggregate model or an agent based model. There's emergent behavior that comes from the model by running the model. There is no right hand side closed form specification in general for a nonlinear model. Um, you're not going to be able to write down what it does over time on the right side of an equation and solve for the parameters as a regression. It doesn't work that way. It's an emergent property of the model. And in general, the only way to generate that is to run the model over time. So, so this starts to get a little bit closer to what you see with um, optimization-based regression techniques perhaps with non-parametric models, but but here we are um, we are capturing it fundamentally as a generative process where it's emergent behavior from the model, and we're trying to find the parameter values the most the best allow that emergent behavior of the model to match with many outputs. It's, it's you're matching against many Y from the world, many observable, right? Some of them about the spatial behavior, some about the network behavior, some about the network structure, some about the behavior over time, the autocorrelation function, the dominant frequency mode. You're matching all of these um, at once and trying to find uh, the best. So. You know, we saw the optimization last time uh, we had loaded it in and we saw that, you know, it was trying to match what came out of the model shown in blue here for a single realization with the uh, empirical data uh, shown here in, in yellow. And it was trying to do that based on a objective function, which was basically computing a discrepancy, a sort of sum squared, or in this case, it's absolute value of this difference. It's it's sort of adding up in so-called L1 norm for those who are familiar with machine learning um, parlance. Um, and we have some historic data and it's it's trying to trying to match it up and and meet it. This would be a pointwise match here. We're trying to get the model to match over time these data points. But in general, we won't be doing that. In general, we'll have the summary measures that we talked about here, like we have here. Okay. Um, so calibration for ABMs is, is uh, a process that involves a little bit more thoughtfulness, more patience, and more time than for uh, then for aggregate models, we have stochastics we have to deal with that mean that point wise matching is generalized generally what we uh, is not what we want to do. And we want measures that will be robust for goodness of match, regardless of the um, of the stochastics. Uh, so we want these measures that will allow matches. I haven't done a thorough job discussing this. There's a set of measures that are sort of time independent as well called field statistics that allow you to uh, also match things that have the same pattern, but at different points of time. Um, okay, so, um, right. Uh, I think I'm going to go light over some of these details uh, in any logic. I will say that, um, 
any logic as a package and some other optimization software that uh, uh, that is used out there, um, possibly for ABMs, um, possibly could uh, allow you to try to estimate uh, values of parameters in a statistically um, uh, a statistically rigorous way, in the sense that you specify when you're setting up the optimization on um, that you want to use a certain number of realizations here called replications for a given set of parameters. So if you have a set of parameters that has tau equal three, mu equal 1.5, beta equal 0.2, to use that cube we were seeing earlier. Um, maybe for that particular assumption, you want to run it enough times so that the sample mean for the uh, uh, for the uh, measure of the the uh, uh, accuracy of the model, the sort of uh, discrepancy of the model, comes within a certain range lies within 0.5% with 80% confidence in uh 80% confidence interval. So the idea here is that you want to run it with enough realizations, a big enough ensemble of realizations that you can reliably count on it to be a pretty good reading of what the discrepancy is for that set of parameters. Because remember, if you don't run it enough, it may tell you, oh, it's really good with those parameters, but that was just a fluke. It was just a chance. It was it was a happenstance. And it may put a lot of emphasis into that being a really good candidate for no good reason, because it wasn't great if you would just run it more. And this allows you to, to come up with an assessment of how good a match it is that is um, has a certain statistical reliability where the estimate of the mean um, the mean discrepancy uh, has become tight enough that you're confident um, of its goodness that that um, that basically uh, a that uh, the the uh, uh, the error, associated with uh, the estimated mean, the standard error for the mean as generated by different discrepancy value, values falls within a certain distance uh, of, of this. Um, so 80% of the time, uh, it's going to fall within this 0.5% uh, range about, about the, uh, the estimate of the, uh, the mean. So this is something which allows you to throttle or allows the software to throttle uh, the, the uh, number of replications, the number of realizations it re reads. So it, it has 80% confidence intervals, um, say uh, here that it's, it's looking at, and it wants it here to fall within this 0.5% um, Around the mean, and and I, I give an an indication there, and this payoff is indicating the um, actually this should be the mean payoff, so it should be divided by forty here, but but basically that's uh, for the discrepancy function. Uh, so here it's choosing to run more realizations or fewer, more replications or fewer in order to achieve a certain quality of read on the, um, on the discrepancy to be observed, the sort of mean, mean payoff uh, to be observed. Um, so again, these mean payoffs should be uh, divided by 10 to indicate that here 10, five over here on the left and 40 here on the right to indicate it's the, it's the mean payoff associated with running it with this set of parameters. And the more you run it, the tighter the standard error around the mean will be. And eventually it will fall within this criteria where 
on uh, 80% in this case of uh, the 80% confidence interval falls within a certain distance of the sample mean of the of the um, uh, the discrepancy function. Okay. Um, so uh, right. So I'm just watching the time here. I'm going to make a few final comments on calibration, and uh, then I'll situate it in, in one broader context, and we'll wrap up. So a few principles about calibration. Calibration is an art as well as a science. Adding in the, a few the rules of thumb here, adding in constraints, adding in extra information to constrain its sense of what good parameter values are. In short, adding in, for example, empirical regularity, extra types of matches, help increase the identifiability, the, the ability to select good parameter values, um, or to, to discriminate one set of parameter values from another, to, to tell what's a good set and what's a bad set. Now, you can add it, you know, as you add these things in, it might not be able to find something that's adequate for all of them, but but it can it can inform that choice of parameter values. Adding parameters to tune leads to a larger space to explore, right? I mean, we we saw this earlier at the cost of, of going back. If this had been two parameters, we would have had just this front sheet to explore, right? If we had explored only mu and tau, we don't have to worry about exploring in this dimension. We just explore this sheet. If we were only at one parameter, we just explore a line along here. We'd have more mu or less mu. If we have three parameters, we have to explore this cube. If we have four parameters, we have a hypercube. Think of a cube that kind of exists you know, it's well, another dimension is time, and and we're exploring it kind of over different different times or something like that, finding the value in time and in this space that's the best. Um, and in general, if we add more parameters, we're really expanding how much we have to search. Yeah, we're we're increasing the space we have to search. You might think we're You'd be mistaken if you think we're giving ourselves, um, you know, uh, a uh, an easier job because we've got more more parameters. Well, it is true with enough parameters, you might be able to match things, or you might not. But you have a lot more space to search for the best parameters, right? Um, adding too many parameters can lead to undetermined situation where there's many, many possible parameter values to allow it to match, right? Um, and just bear in mind, all fits are within constraints of the model. And again, I emphasized before that with dynamic models, it is not true. It is not the case. The common misperception that is there that, you know, with any values of parameters, you can get anything out. That's completely false. You know, there is tremendous structure in the model structure. There's tremendous orderliness, regularity that is induced by the model structure. If you have an SIR model, it will never, the, the, no matter what parameters you assume, you know, as long as they're not negative, the, the recovered, the number of people recovered will never go down over time, right? Um, and the number of people susceptible will never go up over, or never go up over time if it's a closed population I'm talking about. So, it's not the case that any parameter values you can model, you can match anything, but rather, you know, the model constrains what the behaviors are. And we're trying to tune um, the particulars of that to best match the observables. And you can get an underdetermined situation where there's many possible parameter values that will match. Yeah, your qu question here. Yeah, no, no. Good. Yeah, I start to get pretty leery if you start to get above 
10. I have heard people talk about parameterizing 20 and I think, oh, oh, that's really, really tough. I'm no longer sure, you know, you're gonna get to the best possible value of, you know, in that space, reliably find it. But the truth is it's, it's a complicated matter because the parameters are not independent. It's not like, it's not like um, when you choose um, one, you can choose any value for another and any value for another with very little uh, impact. They're, they're so coupled together that often choosing one kind of makes it very obvious what the value needs to be for the other. And so sometimes there's enough structure there, even with more parameters that it will guide you to uh, a good space. Um, but I feel a lot more comfortable, a lot more comfortable with a small number. Uh, you know, three, uh, I feel quite comfortable with. You know, five, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with. Larger numbers, uh, I worry about. Um, I want to see the results and, and I want to test it. I want to run it, many calibrations with those if possible, and see if you get reasonably consistent results out. Because the fear there is that you'll be just exploring arbitrary areas of the space, right? And you'll think you're at the best, but it's just a local minimum, not particularly privileged. And then you'll next time explore another area of the space, come up with another local minimum, and the parameters will be totally different. The parameter vectors you found will be totally vectored. They looked good for what you looked at, but they're, you know, you're you're not able to explore the full space. Um, but you can again, you can have enough structure in some cases that it just guides you. It's so clear where you have to go across multiple parameters that it's not additive. That that actually in that space, in that cube, you're only really dealing with a little corner of it, right? You're zeroing in in that corner because it's so obvious that, you know, you need to, you need to be there, that it's going to drive you there. And really, you're not exploring this much larger space. Um, so that is possible. But um, I will say, uh, I think an under tapped opportunity here is to reduce the number of parameters you have to calibrate by um, doing sensitivity analysis and looking which ones are to which parameters the model is sensitive and not worrying as much about parameters where it's less sensitive over the ranges of output you're seeing. That's one thing dimensional analysis can also help and, and allow you to tune smart combinations of parameters that are kind of the natural combinations. Instead of tuning each of those parameters, you, instead of tuning seven parameters, you train, tune three combinations of them and, and you're much more savvy about that. Um, so a key need, hopefully that's, that's helpful. A key need for calibration is to learn from calibration. And, when you're performing calibration, it helps to try to learn to think like the model. Like, okay, it's not gonna be a perfect calibration. It's gonna exhibit discrepancies. Why is it exhibiting that? Why does it want to have more of this to match to match X really well? Why does it need to you know, match Y worse? Um, there are these tensions that are often evident and uh, you want to figure out why those tensions are there. You want to learn to think like the model. Um, what is it about the model structure that's forcing it to a higher value for this if you want to match that? Um, uh, so, you know, generally you want to um, learn to think like the model. And generally that means making sure you run enough simulations to converge to similar parameter estimates. Um, so um, I'd like to, when we're, we're calibrating, we don't see, particularly if we don't see the results we'd like to. 
you want to try to sort of outsmart it. You want to say, okay, I think I could do better. Um, so maybe it, it gives you a bad calibration and you're unsatisfied with it. Well, don't just say, uh, this is no good. You should, you should say, I think I can do better. Let's start with those parameter values that it gave me. And it's not good. And now I want to manually tweak one. I want to, I think I can lower, look at that. It's really bad, maybe at predicting, I don't know, the number of, uh, the number of, of uh, deaths that it's, that it's matching. So I say, okay, I think I should be able to lower the mortality rate in this model. So you go and you manually lower that and you run the model as you lower it. And what you may find is, oh gosh, if you lower the mortality, that leads to more transmission to susceptibles because the people who would have died would stay alive and transmit. And you discover, wait, it pops out over there. So that's why it wants, it can't match mortality data that well, it tries to minimize more or to maximize mortality in the uh, in the in the model um, over the observed data. It's because if it doesn't do otherwise, it it it's way off on the on the cases. You know that it has this tension. It can match cases really well, or it can match mortality really well, but it can't do both because of this this model invariant that. You know, people stay alive, they mix. And maybe that gets you thinking, well, maybe people who are really sick don't go out and mix as much with other people, or maybe they're in the hospital and therefore they they have less mixing with the general population. It gets you thinking about why the model has this inability to match these different things. So start with what it gives you for calibration and then try to do better. Say, I think I can do better. Okay, show me. And you Try it and you, you see what goes wrong. And that gets you thinking about, okay, this is the fundamental tensions that the model's feeling. Because it's going through the same process. It's trying adjusting mortality. You say, ah, that doesn't work. You know, that that's a real problem now. If I lower mortality of the model, then it causes all these problems with hospitalizations and cases, and I can't do that. You want to see that yourself. So start with what it gave you and try to learn from it by trying different values and seeing why it's worse. Now, of course, if you can find a better one, great, use it. And then you've done a combination of automated and manual calibration, but that would be a sign that it hasn't explored the space too well, right? It's Because it should have discovered something better if it was there. If you can do better than it within the bounds of the constraints you gave it, that's a sign that you know it hasn't explored the space uh, thoroughly. If you have weights in your discrepancy, one thing you can do is set really high weights on the things you want to match. Say, I want to match deaths really, really well. Set a really high rate and see what happens. Set it going. You know, oh my gosh, the cases are horrible now, but it matched deaths really well. Okay, um, that tells you something also about what it thinks. Or set weights to zero or set other weights to zero. Um, see what happens if you don't give it something, a certain type of data. If you don't give it death data at all, what, is it, what does it do? You know, what is it, what's its interpretation of, of the plausible parameter values then? If you're dealing with calibration problems, the best way is to kind of think about them and, and try to outsmart it and try these try these strategies. There are some other things, right? You could increase the number of parameters, give it more flexibility in the calibration. Again, that has its real trade-offs, its real challenges. You could increase the parameter range, do it over a broader range. Um, you could examine the impact of change model structure. You could say, I'm going to introduce an asymptomatic compartment in my model. I'm going to now distinguish between mild TB, you know, early stage TB um, that's infectious for TB, full case of TB disease, tuberculosis disease, between one that's early versus uh, cavitary TB, the most uh, contagious sort, 
or you know, I'm going to impose a change in model structure by stratifying by by sex. So you have men and women as separate separate sexes, or what have you. Um, uh, you could run for a larger number of of optimization runs. Try longer calibrations to let it take more time to explore the space. Um, or try to find other estimates for uncertain parameters that might allow you to avoid having to calibrate them. Um, you know, a good thing to look for is run a couple of calibrations and check are the calibration values unique. If you're doing it with 20 values being calibrated, um, you know, make sure you run it several times and that the values are consistent across the, the 20 times because Otherwise, it could be ending up in an arbitrary area of space because it hasn't explored the space well. Um, and uh, and uh, if they are different, what can that tell you? You know about it besides it's not exploring it enough. Maybe maybe it tells you there's a long valley where it's equally good at matching it. Maybe if you have high contact rate, low transmission probability per contact per discordant contact. So high contact rate, low transmission probability per discordant contact, or maybe if you have a low contact rate, high transmission probability per discordant contact, maybe those give equally good matches. And so maybe you find when you run the, the calibration, it can't decide between them. You know, both are pretty good. Well, okay. Um, then, you know, uh, then maybe that's telling you something about, you know, the model not being fully identifiable in terms of these parameters. Um, and, you know, you can collect more data, you can impose additional constraints uh, on the model from, from data to, to impose it. You could simplify the model, find other estimates from the literature for uncertain parameters, et cetera. Um, another thing, to do to, to really bear in mind if you're calibrating is to look for parameter values that are at the edge of their range. If you give them a range over which to, to span, you may remember this when we specified this um, model, we, we gave these parameters a minimum value and a maximum value. We're searching this cube between a minimum and a maximum. 500 iterations searched within this range, contact rate from this to this, and uh, infection probability from this to this. Um, if you should be looking, are they at the end of their range? Is the best value at the very end of their range, the minimum value you gave or the maximum? Well, if so, that's a little bit suspicious, right? It wants to go further out there. It, it, Somehow it really likes it with with the high values of the parameter. So you might want to try manually. Like, what happens if you do it out there? Why does it like it? Why does it think it's better if you have something out, you know, at the edge or beyond? Right. Um, you could try relaxing the constraints. Run a a, a, a calibration there. Um, it might lead you to collect uh, to challenge model structure. Um, okay, um, right. I will say um, some people get really tied up with initial conditions. This is going to be my final comment on on sort of calibration per se. Um, the initial conditions in the model often we we don't have a privileged understanding of what the starting state of a model should be. Um, because we don't have a good understanding of what the situation in the world is often for the starting point in the model. And you do sometimes find people calibrating the initial condition. Um, um, I, um, I think, you know, this bears thinking because it can add quite a bit to the number of parameters you're calibrating. And the fact is that often the initial conditions kind of wash out after a certain amount of time. It kind of forgets about them. For those here who are mathematically predisposed, the model may have, you know, pronounced negative eigenvalues associated with it that sort of drive it. And it, it just leads it, the transient conditions kind of 
peter out within a few years. Uh, it forgets what its initial state was, um, uh, the details of that initial state because of stochastics and because of the, the regularities of the model. And, and so, you know, you want to be cautious about calibration, but um, sometimes we run a burn-in period where we, sometimes we just run it and it's far enough, you know, it tends to die out. The influence, the initial condition maybe dies out within five years and the model runtime is a hundred years. And, you know, that's, that's peanuts. Like we're running it so long, it really doesn't matter what the initial state was, uh, as long as it was something where, you know, something reasonable. Um, Another thing we do is run what's called a burn-in period sometimes, where this is very common in, in uh, discrete event simulation and operations research type models. You run a model for a certain, like you, you might run it for five years for a burn-in period where you ignore the data. It's the start of your run. You ignore the data generated during that time. You view it as kind of, just getting equilibrated. It just gets, and system dynamics is sometimes called equilibration. The model gets in balance. So often the problem is the initial states aren't in balance with model dynamics. So, you know, the, it's the wrong number of people in different states for it to be in balance. And if you run it five years, maybe they basically get into balance. The number of people who are in this state or that state or that state, et cetera. And after that, you pay attention. But the five-year burden period, you just let it get into the state where it's well-balanced. So that's an often, often thing. So I promised I would just say a word on finishing up about putting this in context. So calibration is the kind of workhorse, bread and butter, very widespread, almost ubiquitous technique we see for arriving at parameter values. We're estimating parameter values with calibration. We're trying to find parameter values that best allow the model to observe, to match data from the world. But you should, be, should recognize that um, there's a set of techniques that are very important and potential great importance for HMA's models that operate with, as per HMA's models, um, with stochastic systems. And with stochastic systems, remember, parameter values are only part of the, the picture. Because for the same parameter values, the model may do very different things. The system may do very have different, very different outcomes um, because of stochastics. And so there's an additional need here. If we want to match what's going on in the world, and especially if we want to look forward and give policy prescriptions for what's going on in the world what for what we should do over the next few months or years. Um, we'd like to know what the current situation is, not, not just what parameter values have been until this point, but what the current situation is. What's the current underlying situation in terms of the number of susceptibles, the number of undiagnosed infectives, the number of people who are recovered, different people at different levels of immunity from immunization. We'd like to understand that underlying reality. And parameter values don't give it to you in a stochastic model. They're not enough to specify it because there's lots of possible outcomes. So there are these techniques, which I teach in a separate fields course. Um, some of you might have taken that fields course that focus on these techniques. And, and um, uh, this, this is worked by uh, one of one of the really world leader in this uh, from our group, Shayad Lee, on um, you know showing the difference from calibration on um, with uh, with calibration, 
in this sort of context, what you get is something that looks like, and I think she has a picture of it here uh, for a calibrated model. Um, so, uh, so this is the result, the blue here is the result of calibration, for example. You calibrate the parameter values as best possible to match this data. And, you know, it's going to be decent, but you're going to miss a lot of it. And, and if you're over here right now, you know, you know what's happened till now, you should be able to predict a lot better what's going to happen. And, and with particle filtering, basically you're constantly re, rematching the model situation with the observed data from the world. Not only, not only worrying about dynamic parameters, parameters that are changing, but the state of the model. So if there's been a recent outbreak, you can predict forward with great confidence what's coming. And indeed, these sorts of models where you're, it's almost as if you're constantly rematching up, recurrently grounding the model. You know, you can match very closely what's going on in the model anytime and use that to predict forward. And you can predict, oh, you know, we're low right now, but there's going to be an outbreak with high probability. There's going to be an outbreak here with, with, with high probability in the next year, for example. Um, you know, you get these sort of indications that very likely there's an outbreak coming just, just as you would with a storm warning. Um, for a weather model. These are machine learning models coupled with dynamic models. So these take machine learning tools, they combine them with dynamic models to arrive at a sort of uh, regrounded model at, at any one point that takes into account what's happened till now, uses that to build in our assumptions of what the current situation is, but many of them allow us to infer to uh, infer the parameters as well to estimate parameter values also. So these techniques go beyond calibration. They go beyond calibration to allow the model to be constantly kind of realigned with these chance events. Given that you know there was an outbreak at at, at a certain time um, here. It sort of takes that into account, takes advisement of it, updates its understanding about what the current situation is in the model, how many susceptibles exposed, infected, recovered, hospitalized um, people there are, and uses that to look forward. So it's constantly going beyond adjusting parameter value assumptions, and it's instead looking at the underlying state of the model. What's the current situation? And applying these techniques with agent-based modeling is, is an open challenge. Uh, we apply them commonly with compartmental models and Cheyenne's results there for compartmental models. But, um, uh, but we have, have done some exploration of it with ABMs and uh, we're gonna be embarking on a new sort of iteration of that with some external partners shortly. So, these are the next generation of technique and they rely on, a, on bringing together machine learning on the one hand and dynamic modeling. So uh, that's all I'll say for, for that here, but calibration is the bread and butter technique that's virtually ubiquitous, but the world is increasingly seeking to value machine learning with dynamic modeling to get an understanding of where we're at now and what's likely to come in the near future. Okay, that's all I have time for here. Thank you for your attention. Um, and I will now open office hours.